One, two, three. Hallelujah. All right, clap for the Lord. Amen. Let's all be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. All right, well, let's, let's pray. And we'll get right into this. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for blessing us, blessing us to be here this morning. We thank you for giving us yet another opportunity to sit at your feet and to receive fresh rhema from heaven. I bind the work of the devil right now in the name of Jesus, that there be no distractions, but that your word would go forth and accomplish that which you've sent it to. We thank you, Lord, and we surrender to the power of the Holy Ghost now in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Clap for the Lord. Amen. Praise God. All right. Um, we started this series uh, a couple of weeks ago entitled Living Better, and we're going to preach Living Better Part 3. Um, what's good about this is, or really just an emphasis, you know, you got to know that Jesus came to make your life better. Amen. Amen. And I think I might have a little bit of a, okay, I might have a little feedback right in here. Um, but he came to make your life better. Amen. This is what he, this is what he wants. And so now it's not always easy. Amen. Every day that you experience in this life is not always easy. Can, I can't get an amen right there. Some of y'all, yeah, I've had those bad days where he said, man, Lord, I need some help. Come on. If you, you, w listen, we're not robots. Sometimes, you know, you're not feeling it. Can I get an amen right here? But Jesus won't let you just stay there. And so we got to understand, we got to come into this place where we all agree. Jesus has come to make my life better, right? John 10, 10, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Matter of fact, I told you, I gave you a warning on Wednesday. The Holy Ghost takes over. Uh, just put up John 10, 10 in the Amplify Classic. I want you guys to focus on one word that's um, super abundantly. Because when you start talking about super abundantly, that's like more than just good. Amen. And so the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and enjoy life uh, in abundance till it overflows. And so um, maybe it's not the Amplified. One of them says super abundantly. And so I don't know which one that is. You guys know which one that is? Let me, let me back up again. Let me back up again. John 10, 10. Let him have life and have it more abundantly. Okay, well, anyway, the, the bottom line, it's, it's a good life. <laughs> and it's going to be big. Amen? And I know that, um, okay, go to this one. Let me give you another one. So this is, first of all, let's understand Jesus has come for us to have and enjoy life. And so you're not just to have life. Some people say, man, I'm just thanking God that I'm alive. Praise God. What else are you thanking him for? Well, I'm just thanking him that I'm alive. Uh, what else you thinking? Ain't nothing else happening? And so it's more than just being alive. You're supposed to enjoy your life. You're not supposed to be struggling and going through. Uh, Ephesians 3.20. Just put that up there. Ephesians 3.20 in the Amplified Classic. I'm just going to, I got to just give you guys this word super abundantly. I know it's there in that one. And so, um, and this is so we don't hesitate and we'll go to God for anything, but go down to the, maybe the next verse. Oh, so he's able to do super abundantly. So what this means is God is able to do super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. And so if he can do all of this, now you put those two scriptures together. Jesus has come that I might have life and have it more abundantly, have it to the point where it's overflowing and I can enjoy life. But now even when I'm praying, he's able to do super abundantly over and above anything I could possibly ask or think. Well, if he's able to do it and he's saying he can do more than you can pray, well, you ought to expect, how many know your prayers ought not be, Lord, just help me get through the day. How many know getting through the day ain't super abundantly above nothing? Well, what's so super abundantly above that? I'll just, Lord, I just pray. I pray I make it through the day. Man, anybody can do that. We're talking about we got to get into some super abundantly. Lord, I want to, oh, y'all, am I in the right place? Lord, I want to enjoy life. 
Oh, come on. Lord, I'm expecting to enjoy life. Lord, I'm expecting some peace today. I'm expecting to walk around here with a, just an abundance of peace. Lord, I'm expecting some favor today. Come on, somebody. Oh, Lord, I'm expect y'all, see? Lord, I'm expecting some money today. Amen. Oh. Yeah. See, I, I believe the reason people don't get into this is because they don't do what is required. When you do what God tells you, your expectations are going to go up. You're never going to be just hoping you make it through the day. You will be expecting to thrive. Amen. And so living better. God wants us to live better. Look at your neighbor and say he wants you living better. Now, I've told you guys this for some time, but you ought to be able to look back. If you look back over your life and you look back, you know, two years. Well, if you've been consistent with God, you should be doing better. Now, maybe you're not where you want to be, but you ought to see progress. Come on, somebody. Oh, man, I've been faithful to God in my finances. I started tithing uh, three years ago. And let me, how much was I making back then? Oh, okay. Oh, wow. It looks like I'm making a lot more. Oh, because this works. See, because this works. See, but if you can't see no progress, you're missing out in some area. And my job as a pastor is to help you understand the principles of God, not just the goosebumps and and the tears when you're sad and all that. How many know, man, cheerleaders don't score touchdowns. They just out there cheering, man. They just doing stuff. But in order for somebody to have some success, they're going to have to go ahead and put it, put the game plan in, in motion. Come on, somebody. You're going to have to follow the rules, amen? You're going to have to follow the plays and get stuff done. That's what I'm teaching you so that now you can apply it and you'll see, oh, man, year after year, I'm getting better. Now, this is not an indictment on anybody or anything like that, but what I've noticed over my years of pastoring, the people that don't grow are disobedient. Guaranteed, I can, if I can find an area of disobedience. If they're still struggling financially, after listening to me teach all these years, they're not obeying. Guaranteed. The ones that obey and they apply the principles, they thrive. I've been telling y'all, you're going to make more money. I got people telling me, we're making more money now. We're getting, I'm making double what I used to make. I'm making, it's, why? This ain't because of me. It's principles, man. It's principles. Here's another thing. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really just encouraging the church to jump on board with me because some of y'all, you jump on board in some areas and other areas, you, you know, you still watching from the shore trying to see if I'm if, if it's real. But I've been telling y'all about how to speak over your body and to speak health over yourself. I've been telling you that for a long time. Some of y'all done jumped on. Some of y'all jump on and your body gets better. You had ailments that you couldn't shake that are gone now. Come on. Some of y'all jump on board and you have medications that was, they was trying to increase the dosage and now they not, you don't, oh, you don't have to take it no more. See what I'm saying? But this is principles. Now some people, they just hear me preach and they just go on about their business and keep doing the same thing. Guess what? You're still in the same situation when I preached that message you heard and said amen and all that five years ago. We got to get out of that. That's a waste of time. We're going from glory to glory. Amen. This is God's plan for us. We're going glory to glory. And so uh, I'm going to put, put an emphasis today on consistency. So this is part three, living better part three. But man, this word consistency is a key factor in your success. Consistency, it means steadfast adherence to the same principles. Steadfast adherence to the same principles. This is not intermittent. This is not come and go hot. You know, this is, listen, we are creatures of habit. Hey Amen. How many of y'all remember when you were a kid? Well, maybe this was just boys, but, and you didn't want to take a shower. <laughs> I can't even name. Or is it, it's just boys? Oh, okay. Because I remember my son didn't want to take no shower. He wasn't into all of that because he couldn't, you know, see himself pulling away from what he was doing, playing his games or whatever he was doing. And then he had this thing where he would do this fast shower. You know, when the kid come out too fast as a good parent, you're like, hey, hold on. 
hold on. You know, because uh, this boy would come out to shower and he wouldn't even dry off. He'd just get out and put his pajamas on. I'm like, man, I can't imagine that anything really got clean. <laughs> but you know what? Now, obviously, you know, but see, there's habits. So you teach them when they're little. You don't do that as a parent. Say, oh, you don't like showers? It's okay. Come on, y'all, some of y'all parents. That kid's 13. You man. You know, matter of fact, when they, when they hit about, like, I don't know, I think because of all the changes in food and everything, this stuff is kicking in. You remember, like, kids when they were little, they didn't have B.O. Y'all know yeah. B.O.? Yeah. You, the kid, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, when you got a five-year-old. Most of the time, five-year-olds, they don't have B.O. At five, at five. Wait, do they? Oh, they got five. They got it at five? Oh, Lord. Well, it used to be a time where when a five-year-old, you know, they could sweat all day. They didn't need no deodorant. You know what I'm saying? A five-year-old. But, you know, when they, they start getting around 9, 10, 11, they start smelling strong. <laughs> you start smelling some strong, like something's strong up in here. Well, you had to give them some new habits, right? You had to teach, come y'all. You had to teach them, hey, you know what you got to do? You're going to have to take a shower, and then you're going to have to put on some deodorant. Oh, what days, Dad? Only on Mondays, too? No. You're going to have to be consistent, man. This is, you, this is every day. But that's a habit. Well, see, we're creatures of habit. And so it's the same thing in the church. We are creatures of habit. And so you've got to develop new habits. You've got to develop habits to where it's just normal for you. That's what we do. When do we do it? Every day or all the time, you know, I've been telling you guys, you got to read your word. You got to do all these things. These are just habits that you have to develop. Amen. And so once again, it's where consistency, steadfast adherence to the same principles. It's not trying to change something all the time. That's where the church gets in trouble. Instead of simply having patience and just obeying and keeping your nose to the grind and just doing what God says, People look for a new revelation. I said, this ain't working yet, so maybe I need to go over here and listen to this person. No, there are no shortcuts with God. You don't get rich quick. You don't get married quick. You don't get a house quick. You don't get nothing quick with God. If it happens that fast, probably ain't God. Because God is looking to have you advance and keep going forward instead of being on this slippery slope. You ever met those people, they were happy? Come on, when they won the lotto or something. But they never learned biblical principles of finances, and so they broke again. How come broke keeps finding people? Because they have not learned principles. And, that, and broke finds church people. Because they don't develop new principles. Amen? You can't just get some money and just be like, I'm going to spend it all, praise the Lord. You have to apply biblical principles to your money so that now you can have things change. So we need to learn to be consistent. Now, when it comes to God, I want to encourage you because sometimes people, they don't see this connection. And that was one of the greatest things that could have ever happened to me is God showed me the connection between my obedience and my prosperity. So he showed me that if I obey him, then now I'm going to be blessed. And so he allowed me to see that connection. Now, this is sometimes difficult because we're in such a uh, age of compromise to where, uh, we, you know, we don't want anybody to have any discipline. You know what I'm saying? We don't want to have anybody to have any structure. You can do what you want, show up when you want, do all this, all this stuff that used to be structure. And so, but if you want to succeed in the kingdom, I mean, oh, the world can change all they want, but the kingdom ain't changing. And so if you want to have success in the kingdom of God, you're going to have to learn how to be consistent in applying these biblical principles. So go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Amplify classic. The more consistent you are, the easier it becomes to stay consistent. Amen? If you ever cross that threshold where now it's easy you're you it's just normal for you to go to church at least every Sunday 
Well, then when you miss, it will be strange. But if you never cross that line, if you still come on somebody having made it one month in a row. Oh, yeah. Y'all don't want me. If you still ain't made it every single Sunday in one month. Oh, well, you know, pastor, some comes up, but every month. You mean to tell me something's coming up in your life every single month? You don't have one month where you got four Sundays free. Out of the whole year? See what I'm saying? No, stuff comes up. Stuff comes up because when you are not consistent, now you become vulnerable. Because there's a kink in your armor. And so you're not training properly. So people that don't train properly... They're easy to be victimized. Amen? And so I'm trying to help you to understand. You might think, oh, man, it's just, it doesn't seem like this is working. Man, I just go to church. I'm going to church on Sunday. I'm going on Wednesday. But oh, I still got these issues in my life, and I'm da-da-da. Oh, that consistency is paying off. Just watch out, because it's paying off. You're sowing kingdom seed. And the enemy will always try to give you a reason to stop sowing that kingdom seed. Because that kingdom seed is bringing a, an abundant harvest. So he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So the things of God always abound in those things. And then he says, always being superior, excelling, doing more than enough in the service of the Lord. Now, let me just pause. This is one of the things I learned. God uh, really taught me. He says, that I will make more money in the secular world when I commit to him as a priority. Amen? And so what does this mean? If I serve God with excellence in the church house, then now, oh, come on. See, because some of y'all are a better employee than you are a church goer. Uh, y'all don't want me to get up in here. See, some of you guys are more faithful to your job than you are to this church. Huh? But you haven't caught this revelation. See, you're being deceived. You're being tricked because all the job can do is pay you what the job can give you. But if you start applying kingdom principles, look at this. Being superior, excelling, doing more than enough in the service of the Lord. Can you can you assess yourself and say, man, I'm being superior. I'm giving God excellent service. Oh, come on, somebody. I am excelling. I'm doing more than enough. I only needed to do this much, but I'm going the distance. I'm going out there even further in the service of the Lord. These are things that we learned before we got ordained. We learned this stuff. We learned like, oh, wow. When we went to church in San Diego, I've told you guys this for years, but initially, we kind of call ourselves being offended when they ask us to serve in the kids' ministry. We said, man, we're traveling all the way from Temecula. Well, they didn't ask us to travel from Temecula. That ain't their fault. But the fact was, is they said, well, you know, we notice you bring your kids and praise the Lord for that, so we need you to start serving. Oh, really? Oh. So me and my wife are like, wow. So all these other people live around here, you know what I mean? But we just, you know, we got to, okay. Do you know the Holy Ghost convicted us on the way home? We didn't even get to laugh. See, if you, oh, I'm helping y'all today. If you are allowed to complain too long, you might, you might need to pray and ask God, where's the Holy Ghost? Am I really okay? Because I've been complaining for too long and I ain't been checked yet. I might be in danger. Because the Holy Ghost don't let you stand that. And so on our way home, the Holy Ghost got on both of us. And so we said, well, you know, we, maybe we can do it like once, you know, I don't know, once a month or something. You know what I mean? Because down back then we had two services. So if you served, uh, most of the time you go to the early morning service, get the word, then you serve in the second service, which was more people, and that was the most exciting service. That's when the word of knowledge is going forth and pastors flowing into gifts and all that. And so, but guess what? You, we serving during that time. 
Well, we listened to the Holy Spirit, took, took heed to that conviction, and man, we called them, we said, we're going to do it every Sunday. Now, somebody might say, well, really? So y'all, you guys are patty caking over here, man. I'm glad I ain't in charge of the children's ministry. Because, can you please do it once a month? Once a month? <laughs> We're begging people to serve over here, man. You know what I'm saying? Why? That's because, and that's on me, because I ain't teaching it right. So I got to teach you the connection. You got to learn to be faithful in the house of God first. That's going to that's gonna cause things to uh, explode for you in the secular world. You're going to start to make more money in the secular world. You'll start to get promotions and all kind of stuff. Why? Because it's always kingdom first. If it's kingdom first, then he'll take care of everything else. But if you're struggling and you're giving God some little leftover service, you know what I'm saying? And I have to check myself because sometimes I'm nice, but I have an expectation. And I'm like, Lord, and, and I'm easy. I try to be, you know, I try not to be too strict, but I remember, man, sometimes God will be getting on me and I'll be like, because I want excellence in the church. Amen. I have to pray because if I come in here and something ain't right, I got an attitude. I'm being honest. I got an attitude. So I got to go back there and pray and just, you know, Lord, everybody's just serving the Lord and just, you know, so Lord, let me just back up. You know what I'm saying? I'm serious. I'm honest. If I hear Mike's out of whack, people ain't up, I get, I had to go pray. I'm like, this is, you know what I'm saying? Then I just remember, we're we doing the best we can, giving God our best. But I want to raise that level of expectation. Amen. I want us to give God not our best. How many know your best ain't enough? You need to excel to excellence. Don't give God your best. Because your best is without the anointing. Oh, come on. You can do your best on your own, but you need the anointing to step into excellence. Amen. You need the anointing to step into excellence. And so now when that anointing is flowing, we will be doing what this is saying. Knowing and being uh, or being superior, excelling, doing more than enough in the service of the Lord. You see what I'm saying? I don't care if you're in the parking lot up in here singing. It ought to be like the man it ought to be under the anointing of the most high God it ought to be like bam you see what I'm saying not oh man one day we show up we got no parking lot workers oh who's ushering today oh, I don't know I'm trying to get it together hey can you pass the basket you know that's ghetto that's just plain up ghetto man I ain't getting nothing from God and so we gotta we gotta tighten that you see what I'm saying? You can't be up here singing and y'all don't know the words. What's going on? Who are you singing to? Oh, you thought you were singing to me and you said, well, ain't nobody here yet because everybody come late to this church. So no, you singing to Jesus. And so you got to be on point. And guess what else you got to be? In key. Huh? In key, man. You can't be off key. Talking about you praising the Lord. You messing up my praise. You understand what we're doing? Amen. This, this is not that. See, my job is to help us understand this is kingdom. This is not secular. This is not the world. It, we don't care what they do. If they're down the street, they let you wear uh, them raggedy, you know, grown men over 50 wearing these tight jeans. They let you do that up in there. That's fine. But we ain't doing that. You know what I'm saying? You got you to gotta, uh, listen. You got grown men today, pastors, and they got bellies. And you got on some little tight. Come on, man. Get out of here with that. What you doing, man? Ain't nobody impressed with that stuff. It ain't God. You see what I'm saying? And what's the church always trying to make feel, people feel comfortable? Try to lower our standards. You're not doing this for the world. You're doing this for God. And the kingdom don't change. And nothing changes in the kingdom. The standard is always high in the kingdom. 
always. Now, I'm, I'm sharing these things because I want us getting the benefits from the kingdom. I want us to get what God has so if we can excel doing more than enough in the service of the Lord, knowing and being continually aware of that. Next verse. He says that your labor in the Lord is not futile. It's not wasted. It is never wasted or to no purpose. So what I do for God, I can, man, it, this kingdom seed will never die and it does not know how to not produce. It will multiply. It will produce. Amen. I'm living proof, man. I'm telling you, I'm living proof of this. I have had to prioritize and put the kingdom first and God has blessed my family. He has blessed us and he will continue to do that. But there's no shortcuts. There's no way around it. And so we got to learn that. Let me be one that's found faithful. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Let me be found faithful. Man, I even changed the church time to 730 on Wednesdays because we people, I can't make it. OK, well, we've changed to 730. At least if you come, even if you come late, do the very best you can. Amen. Get in here. Kick and scratch to get here because there's stuff coming that you need. Amen. And so go to Revelation now. Revelation 3, 8 in the message translation. So I believe in this. I believe in being consistent. He says, this is what God says. This is how he opens doors. I see what you've done. Now see what I've done. Y'all, I don't even know if y'all got that. Look at how God starts this out. I see what you've done. Oh, so what about all them people said that works don't matter? What about all those hyper grace teachers? They said, oh, the grace of God, it doesn't matter what you do. Well, what does it say? I see what you've done. So to me, that tells me that God's looking at me. I see what you've done. Now see what I, this is, I, this is the if then theory. If you do this, you're going to get that. That's all throughout the Bible. If you do this, I'm going to do that. It's never... You're just going to get this anyway because I'm such a, lo a loving God and caring and, you know, no, you got to obey. So I see what you've done. Now see what I've done. I've opened a door before you that no one. Y'all see this can slam shut. Oh, man, they just they don't give they don't seem like they like me at that job. They're not, they're overlooking me for promotions. That, but what are you doing for the kingdom? See, because if you're dependent on them to smile upon you, then now when they decide to frown, then your favor is gone. But when you depend on God, when you say, I'm going to please God, I'm going to do the very best I can for God. Well, guess what? God will open up a door for you that nobody can shut. They won't be able to stop you. They can't nay say against you. They hate on you. They, listen, it does not matter what they do. Because you have submitted to a superior power. When you're in a tug of war. With man, you're battling, like I told you last week, in the first heaven. But Jesus says, Ephesians 2, 6, he raises us up to sit down next to him in the third heaven. And so we're above all of this stuff. So we're able to live a better way. I've opened a door for you that no one can slam shut. You don't have much strength. So that's what he's wanting to remind you. Listen, in and of yourself, you're not going to make it. I've been telling people for years, just give up. Oh, pastor, that's not very motivational. Good. I want you to quit. What do you mean? Quit trying to do it yourself. Why don't you go tell God, I can't do this. So if you don't do it, it ain't getting done. And watch what happens. His strength is made perfect in weakness. You know what he'll do? He'll show up because you moved out the way. But if you keep trying to stay in the way, you're going to struggle along. But you come to the end of yourself. I can't do it. Ain't going to make it. Then his strength comes alive in you. And now you're walking in his power, not your own. Amen. And so he says, praise God. I know that you used what you had to keep my word. So the little bit of strength you have, 
See, I'm trying to encourage you guys. Yeah. Oh, Pastor, I'm tired. But the little bit of strength you got, come on. Yeah. Pastor, I feel like all this stuff is, is closing in on me. But the little bit of strength you got, yeah. come on. The little bit of strength you got left, keep his word. Amen. See what I'm saying? You say, man, I, don't, I can't figure all this stuff out and I'm feeling weary, but I'm going to keep this word. Come on, I'm going to keep this word. I'm going to just stay with this. Okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to stay with this word. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep trusting you. And so he says, you use what you had to keep my word. You did, y'all in here? You, anybody getting this today? You didn't deny me when times were rough. See, people fall off in rough times because they have poor habits. They have not been training. Listen, you can't just give God the glory when things are going good. You got to get used to praising him all the time and staying consistent with biblical principles. And that way, when things get rough, you won't fall off because this is what you do. You see what I'm saying? This is what you do. And that's when stuff begins to work. When people try stuff and stop, they never developed a new habit. And so they come in. That's where uh, we have people who, it's just like when 9-11 hit, everybody want to pack the church. But in three weeks, they left the church because it wasn't real to them. It was a, a panic, a sense of urgency. The kingdom doesn't flow on panic and sense of urgency. The kingdom flows according to divine order. This is all planned out before God. And that's why you've got to learn to practice Biblical principles consistently and this type of stuff is going to make your life better. I'm telling you, man, nobody can tell me this doesn't work. Listen, it's hard to tell somebody it don't work when somebody's working it. And so people, they're not happy. They have all this stuff. Somewhere in there, you're slipping. And you just need to acknowledge it. And say, okay, Lord, show me. But if you would just be committed to God and then learn this consistency, he will open up doors for you. And this is where the favor comes in. Do you understand? You don't even, <laughs> wow. You know promotion comes from God? Amen. Anybody in here with me? Amen. Promotion doesn't come from the north, south, or, or the, the east or whatever, or the south, however it says it, the east or the west or the south. It comes from God. He'll put up one. Come on. Oh, man, I'm under the Holy Ghost. What scripture is that? Psalm, let me see, Psalm 77 or uh, 75 or I don't know. I'm going to find it. And maybe y'all might find it before me. Okay, Psalm 75, 6 and 7. Let's put that up in the King James. So don't be trying to get in good with your boss. I just, you know, I just hope he sees me do this or I hope she sees me do that. Don't worry about what they see. Please God. For a promotion comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. Look at this. Verse eight. Or excuse me, verse seven. But God, who's the judge? Wait, wait, wait. You don't control my promotion. Are you, what, if you, what if you walk through your life like that? Oh, no, no. You don't control my promotion. Now, I'm saying you, you don't got to go around telling people this, trying to be mean. But, but if you had that mindset, you'd never complain about uh, a boss or whoever they are. You know, if you complain about that boss and you and you try to pray about it, you know what God's going to talk to you? Who are you going to talk to you about? You. So you go in there and you're praying about that boss. Well, Lord, I just feel like they just. And then he said, oh, let me talk to you about you. Oh, but I, I wanted to talk to them about them because what they did was and then God's going to bring it all. Well, let me you. You know what I'm saying? In a lot of cases, they're not God's children. So God will tell you, uh, they don't belong to me, but you do. So let me deal with you. Y'all in here with me. And so, but God is the judge. He puts down, y'all see this? 
He puts down one and sets up another. So that's what God will do. He'll promote those of us who have committed to the kingdom. And then now you don't have to worry about uh, cutting in front of somebody, stepping over somebody. You just got to obey God. Just please God in everything you do. Amen. And he'll lift you up. See, he's opening doors that no man can shut. He's bringing promotion and getting you and uh, causing you to, to be lifted up. And so we got to understand it's worth it to stay consistent with God. Let God see that in your life. Let God see you as one that is consistent in the things of God. Committed, dedicated, wholeheartedly to the things of God. Amen? Because it's going to be very beneficial. It's worth it to stay consistent with God. It's going to pay off. And I, I keep saying this, things will most definitely get better for you. I've not met one person. I've not met one person that has applied biblical principles consistently and not gotten better. I don't know one. But I know plenty who are not applying it and keep wondering why. Most of the time people come to me for counseling, they never tell me the whole story. Say, Pastor, I don't know why this is happening. That's why I've learned to start dealing with people directly. You know what I mean? Don't blame everybody else for the situation you're in. Well, what are you doing about it? What's different in you? And because you can't really correct other people, you can only correct yourself. Amen? Let's go to uh, Galatians, Galatians 6, 9. So this stuff is real, man. Galatians 6, 9, Amplified Classic. So th this is why it's got to be a lifestyle. It can't just be something you uh, tap into from time to time. This has got to be a lifestyle. So he says, and let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time at the appointed season, we shall reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. And so this is important because of where we are today in our world. We're in a world today that is uh, on a, a, a radical decline morally, right? And so even in the midst of a compromising, morally deficient, shortcut society, that's where we live. Morally deficient, the things that are displeasing to God are now being put out in front of you as though they are the new norm. Come, I can't get amen up in here. And so it's just more and more. Why? Because there's a demonic agenda, a demonic strategy to take over, to take over your kids. Uh, that's why, you see, they want them to be desensitized. And so they want to teach them in school that, you know, it's OK for a man to be with a man. It's OK for a woman to be with a woman. Oh, you know what? Today, if you don't want to be called your male name, Come on, just let us know and we'll call you the female name. Well, how many know that is not how it works in the kingdom? And so what we're doing is people are being set up for failure. And now you become desensitized to what is right. Now, it doesn't mean that you're mean, but you're desensitized to what is right. We have to stand up for what is right. You're not teaching my kid that. But you see, it's all strategic. It's all a plan. Why? To move us from the kingdom. Who do you think's behind this? It's the devil. It's the same thing he did with Job. He said, he said, he went to God and said, well, man, he's only following you because you got that hedge around him. The devil's trying to get the church away from the hedge. Because if we're away from the heads, we don't have the protection and stuff starts falling off. So what happens? Pastors start getting shot in pulpits. I mean, are you kidding me? People are getting killed going to church. What is going on? The hedge is down. Why? Because they got you marching for Black Lives Matter instead of standing up with the word and say, we shall follow the book. 
See what I'm saying? This, is a, this stuff is a travesty. And then people follow stuff they don't even know anything about. You, you see what I'm saying? Black Lives Matter, really? Do they? Ask the Black Lives Matter people if Black Lives Matter. They will tell you, no, they don't. Money matters. You'd be surprised if you just did a little research and you found out who was funding all these things. They're not even black. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I've been saying this for a long time. We got to commit to this. That, listen, you, you're not going to get a social justice through marching. You're going to get justice because the king of glory is over your life. And you've submitted to the most high God. And how many know you will have favor everywhere? I met so many people, so many black people. They said, black, what? Nobody discriminates against me. I buy what I want. Oh, come on, y'all. You see what I'm saying? I remember Bill Winston was saying something about he was raised in Tuskegee, Alabama. In the South. Isn't the South supposed to be racist? Well, he said in Tuskegee, they had the highest per capita amongst black people in terms of earnings. Now, Bill Winston is 75, 76 years old. So we're talking when it was really supposed to be racist. He said, oh, I didn't. He said, I didn't know that I was disadvantaged as a black person. He never knew it. Somebody said, well, they're not going to let you do that because you're black. He said, well, black what's that. What you mean? They're not going to let me do it because in his community. There were doctors, dentists, come on somebody, lawyers. Um, there were the Tuskegee Airmen, so pilots. All the, He didn't know that supposedly being black was something that is caught to cause him to be uh, suppressed. He had to get into the world and the world tried to indoctrinate him. So you need to teach your kids that. You need to teach your kids that it's not important what color you are. You didn't choose that anyway. What matters is what are you doing with Jesus? Because Jesus is the great equalizer. You don't have to worry about nobody discriminating against you if you got Jesus as Lord over your life. Because how many know the kingdom is mixed with all kind of people? It really don't matter where we come from. It matters what are we doing with Jesus? You see what I'm saying? Don't fall for this stuff, man. And I don't let my kids do it. I, I don't, I'm not trying to hear that. Oh, it's tough for a black man. Please. Get saved. Sanctified. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Walk in the anointing. Walk in favor. You will not be hindered because of your skin color. Because this stuff is supernatural, man. You understand demons don't know nothing about black and white. Demons know about the blood of Jesus, amen? And then looking, they said, do I see the blood? I don't see it. When they look and they see the blood, hey, wait, let me back, let me back up off of that one. See, and the, and the devil's been very strategic and he's gotten a lot of people to stray away from this book. All along has been here. It's not been in no voting poll. Right. Nothing, is it? It's here. Yeah. See what I'm saying? But we cannot allow ourselves to be contaminated, watered down. So what are we doing? Instead of trying to be like God, trying to be like the world. And so we lower our standards. And we just, you know, start sliding into areas that God doesn't want us to be in. Because we're walking in love. So we got to love everyone. You know, when you love people, let me tell you this. If you raise your kid and you don't give them no whoopings, y'all don't want me to get into all this. You just raise them because, you know, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in no whoopings. Okay. But you love them. You know, it's just like you told me you love me. But I'm about to step into the street and there was a truck coming and you didn't tell me. But you love me. I sure love pastor. If you love me, you would have told me that truck's coming. And if if you needed to, you would have snatched me by my collar. 
Because I sure would have did it to you. I sure would. That's why I tell the truth like I do. God changes my messages all the time. I have all this stuff I study and then he, I get in here and he has me preach in these type of ways because that's what is needed right now. I don't plan this. I just surrender to it. All right. So go to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, uh, 13. This is all you parents that refuse to discipline your kids. I've been telling you for years. That failure to discipline is going to come back and bite you. And it's going to be me, the same old pastor, praying for you while your kid is out of control. So Proverbs 23, 13, King James says, withhold not correction from the child. You see that? So we're in that. Listen, in this society today, people don't do that. They don't they don't believe in, you know, man, me and my wife, we our kids knew. You want to fall out in the store? We're going in the bathroom. We're going in the bathroom right now. And when we come out, you, you're going to be good. They don't do that stuff no more. You know what I'm saying? Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod. <laughs> Some of y'all say, that's why I don't read no King James, man. Because I, I think King James, they was twisting it up a little bit. It is what it is. It's discipline. But what does it say? If you beat him with the rod, he shall what? He ain't going to die. You see what I mean? Next verse. But this is what I want you to focus on. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and what? Stop right there. So if I choose not to correct my child, then what I'm doing is giving them a ticket to hell with my church going self. See, that's, you got to apply principles. Nobody cares about you saying hallelujah, praise the Lord. What are you doing? How are you living? Are you raising your kids according to the book? Are you ordering your, you, you, you're running your house? Come on, man. Some of y'all got, ah, go over to God. It's your house. It's your house. Don't let no mess go on in your house. You're held responsible for your house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You've got to establish that. That's biblical principles. If they don't like it, oh well. We used to say, kick rocks. Get to stepping. Man, well, I'm only 15. Well, hopefully you can get a job. Huh? You got to be willing to. But these are biblical principles. If people don't apply biblical principles, they will let this teaching of the modern day water everything down. And now all of a sudden, you know, your little child is acting up and you don't do nothing. I just please. Can you just um now, don't act like that, sweetie. Whoop that kid. Come on, immediately snatch that kid up. Bam! Give him a sting. Put some heat in that situation. You know what I'm saying? What they gonna do? They gonna act right. They didn't like that sting. But if you don't take care of it now, hmm? So now, these kids are growing up, and they're bigger than you. But you didn't instill nothing. See, back in the day, we used to know what a look meant. Y'all learned that. Uh, you know what a look meant. It's like you get a look, and you're like, <laughs> hey, you start trying to whistle. <laughs> right? But it, it start, those are, those are biblical principles. You just got to apply them. Amen. So it's not that we got to be mean to kids and stuff. You know, don't, don't whoop your kids when you're mad and angry. Don't do that. You're not to, supposed to be beating them up like that. But this is the message that is here. If I can train them properly, I'm going to save them from hell. And so, Lord, help me to train them properly 
so that they could be saved from hell and they can experience life in the blessing. But this does not work if we don't apply biblical principles and if we don't learn to do it consistently. Amen? Amen. So not just because it feels good sometimes or sometimes it doesn't. You know, you got to just do what God says. Amen. And so if we understand this, even in the midst of a uh, compromising, morally deficient, shortcut society, we, that's us in the body of Christ, we stay true. We say, no, we're going to follow God. It doesn't matter if everybody. Now, let me just help you understand this. This does not mean we don't love people. Amen. We, we love everybody. I'm the type of person. I can be around people and it doesn't, it won't affect me. I won't treat them different, but I just won't compromise on the truth. Amen. And, and we just got to have a standard to where we're willing to pray because if you compromise on the truth, then you're not going to pray effectively for people because you're going to think that whatever way they want to live is fine with them. But the question is, is it fine with God? And so it doesn't mean you're their judge, but now you're praying for God to move in these situations. Now, what we lack in our world, I've been teaching you guys this for some time, is evidence. We lack the evidence. We lack the evidence that people say, you know, those people are with God and this is happening. So it shows that God is real. Now, um, go to Kings. We'll go to 1 Kings 8.21. I'm going to give you guys some things here um, to make sure we're clear on this. So we know the story, Elijah, right? Elijah's going against the prophets of Baal and, you know, all this type of stuff. And it's all this, you know, the, the, the children of Israel, they're all uh, having what's called a, a, a mixed opinion, you know? It's kind of like our world today. Sometimes they want to stand for God, then sometimes they want to go to the club. Can I get amen right here? Well, I want to stand for God, but then... Over here, you want to do what the world does. Well, this is what Elijah said. He told, he told, um, he told the king, uh, I think it was Ahab, but he told him to get all the people together and I'm going to speak to them. But I want you to see this message that he said. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God. Look at your name and say, if the Lord is God. Now, what we got to understand is we don't need to debate with nobody. We don't need to get into arguments with nobody. Some people might come to you with different belief systems. I'm not trying to argue with you. But let me tell you what I do. And that's what we have to establish. He says, if the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. Y'all know what I do with fences. If I find out you're on a fence, I want to kick it down. Because I'd rather you go 100 for the devil than to be giving God 50. Amen. And so, but if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Now, let's look at this in the message. So it says here. Elijah challenged the people, how long are you going to sit, what? On the, on the fence. If God is real, if he's the real God, then follow him. But if it's Baal, then follow him. Make up your minds. See? Now he's talking to some people who said they believed. And so a lot of the stuff coming out, see, this is not a message to the secular world. The secular world, they've already chosen. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like your heathen cousin already chosen who they serving. So you're not arguing with them. You know who you, you need to argue with? Is your fake auntie who goes to the church and shakes the tambourine on Sunday, but wants to cuss people out by Wednesday. That's who this message is to. Because that's what's creating more damage. The people that are sinning and, and just out there sinning, they're not creating the problems. It's the watered down Christians that still want to go to the winery. They still want to do everything that the secular world does. Well, just choose, man. 
If you want to serve Baal, serve him. Go ahead. We ain't mad at you. But quit trying to. Oh, man. Uh, that's what I want, man. People just be 100. Don't play with it. Just do it. If you, if, that, if you want God, go in on him. If you don't want God, back up off of him. Because evangelism is not trying to wake up the same people. Evangelism is going to get some new people. Share the gospel to the world. Don't just keep trying to twist people's arms. Please. Amen. All right. Now, here's what's going on. And this is what we need to know. And this will wake up the church. It'll wake up the secular world. Skip down to verse uh, 36. So now, Elijah is telling the people, if you don't want to serve God, then don't serve them. If you want to serve Baal, you know, just make up your minds. But then he tells them, there's a challenge. So what's going on? You got all these prophets of Baal, and he's like, you know what? It's like 450 of them and only one of me. So what, uh, what you going to do? Well, go ahead. Let them get their sacrifice. Let them pray. Let them do their ceremonial things to their God. And then Elijah said, I'm going to sit back and wait. Just go. I'm going to let them go first because it's more of them. And so these guys are praying and crying out to Baal. And how many know Baal ain't doing nothing? Because Baal ain't real. And so Baal's not moving. He ain't coming up to, to, to take care of no sacrifice. He says, Elijah said, who's ever God comes down and fire comes down and it burns up the sacrifice, that's the real God. Baal never came. Then Elijah starts mocking him. Well, what is your God? Is he on vacation? And they crying and now they're like, ah, oh, they start cutting themselves and they're doing all this stuff because they can't get their fake God to move. But how many know there is a real God? And when you're in right standing with the real God, you can get the real God to move. So Elijah, I want to see you. I want to show you how Elijah approached the real God. And so now when it was time for, and then before this, Elijah told him, okay, now you're getting my sacrifice ready. Pour water all over it. Pour, let the whole thing be surrounded by water. That way, you know, if God's going to bring fire, only God can bring that kind of fire. And so now when it was time for the sacrifice to be offered, Elijah the prophet came up and prayed, O oh God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make it known right now. So let me just, we're going to close in a minute, but you can go to God with this kind of prayer. If you're in right standing with him. If you're not in right standing with him, you're going to be talking about, well, whatever the Lord's will is, whatever, I, I'll see you. I'll see you next Sunday if it's the Lord's will. How many know it's his will for you to come to church every Sunday? You ain't trying to figure that out. That's already his will. But that's people who aren't in right standing. And so it's always that if, what if, it might, you know. Well, this is what Elijah said. Make it known right now that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I'm doing what I'm doing under what? Your orders. What if you came to God like that in your prayers? What if you came to God and said, God, I need you to move. If I'm doing what you told me to do, and you the God you said you are, then move on this situation. Oh, can we go to God like that? Well, Elijah did. Next verse. Answer me, God. Come on, how many y'all? You see, you don't get like that in your prayers. Say, Lord, I'm just, uh, oh, Lord. If your obedience is correct, you'll be bold in your prayers. Yes. You're not going to be begging God anything. You're going to be standing firm. Answer me and reveal to this people that you are God, the true God, and that you are giving these people another chance at repentance. That's what he said. You know what God did? God moved. God moved and came up in there, man, and sent that fire and just quenched, just took up that whole sacrifice. And all these people were amazed. 
they were amazed and they began to bow and worship God because they saw something real in manifestation. And so when we're in right standing with God, we can call on him this way. Amen. I mean, you don't want anything to hinder you. You don't want anything to get in your way so that now you will not be found in right standing with God. You can, if in right standing with God, now you have uh, an approach that you can go to God with that is different. And you can put a demand. Y'all have heard me preach about placing a demand on heaven. Listen, man, if you're doing right by God in your finances and you come into a financial shortage, oh no, you can put a demand on heaven. Amen. Come on, you can start decreeing. Now, some money coming in here uh, because we've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. Amen? Amen. So there's more to this and we'll continue, but I'm going to have to close for today. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you for meeting us here to this morning. We thank you for your word. Your word is true. Help us to be a people that don't compromise. Help us to be a people that choose this day who it is we're going to serve. We're going to serve you, Lord. Uh, we don't care what the world says. We don't care what the world does. We have made it up in our minds that we're going to stand for truth we're going to stand for righteousness. We're not going to compromise and we're going to expect you to move like only you can. Now I ask that you help us all. Now maybe where uh, you're watching this or you're here and you don't know Jesus as Lord. Well, that's that first step to a new life, a better way. Just give your life to him. But you gotta be willing to offer yourself as that sacrifice. So if that's you, maybe you're watching right now. Just let God know you want him. Now church, let's say this prayer. Let's repeat it together so that anyone who hears this message will know how to receive Jesus as Lord. Repeat after me. Jesus, please forgive me for all of my sins. I commit my life into your hands. This day, I am saved. Do with me as you please and fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap right there, amen.